you are wanting to learn how to play the clarinet, then you are in the right place because in this video, I'm going to go super in depth with all of the fundamental foundational things that you need to go from knowing literally nothing about the clarinet, not even having an instrument, to actually playing a simple melody by the end of this and having the foundation to become a really great player with just a bit of practice. So just a couple quick disclaimers before we get started. This video is intended for very beginners on the instrument, people who have been playing for less than a year probably. If you have more experience than that, then this may not be super interesting. However, there are timestamps in the description or little chapters in the, the play uh, timeline or the play bar uh, down below. So if you want to see what I'm going to be talking about and sort of skip ahead to something that might be useful for you if you're a more advanced player, then that's great. If you are really new to the instrument and truly are a beginner, then I highly suggest that you take your time through this, maybe take some notes, pause it, actually work through it on your own because there's gonna be a lot of information in here, but if you really can get comfortable with it and familiar with it and put it all together, then you'll be in a great place starting off your clarinet journey. All right, the first thing we're going to be talking about is the actual equipment you need. So the first and most obvious one is that you're gonna actually need a clarinet. So for clarinets, um, you can check out my video on how to buy a clarinet. That includes also intermediate and professional level clarinets to be looking at. For a beginner, someone just starting out, I highly recommend going with a student model clarinet. Usually they're maybe slightly more durable. They're made out of plastic, so you don't have to worry about caring for the wood and things like that. And they're just great to get started. My number one recommendation for a beginner is a student model Yamaha clarinet. I find that those are the most reliable. You could also do some other major name brand beginner student model clarinets that will also work well. If you go to your music store and they have a particular kind that they usually recommend to beginners, that's a great idea. Also, speaking of music stores, it's a great idea to rent your instrument from a music store if that's an option for you, or you can also look for used student instruments. That's usually a way to get started at a pretty affordable price. Now, if price is really a big restriction for you and you have a very limited budget, but you really want to get started playing the clarinet, you can actually go for some of the cheaper, they're manufactured in China on Amazon and they're very affordable instruments, but they're not the best quality. However, that being said, I've had some students who've purchased the Mendini clarinet on Amazon. It's goes for between $70 and $100 for the clarinet, and it comes with everything that you need to get started playing. So if you are really, really on a tight budget, that can be an option, but I definitely recommend going with a more name brand Yamaha or something like that student model clarinet to get started. One other thing about the actual instrument, if you aren't buying a new instrument or renting an instrument from a music store, if you're buying it used, I highly recommend taking it to a local repair person to have them check it over, make sure that everything's in good shape with it. If you end up getting something like the Mendini or one of the very cheap brands off of Amazon, then you're not gonna have much luck getting that repaired if it needs to be repaired. Sometimes they have warranty things and you can send it back and they'll send you a new one if there is issues with it when you get it. That's one of the big downside to those off-brand, really cheap instruments, is that most repair people don't have the right parts to work on them because they're not as mainstream. And lots of repair people don't like working on them because they are pretty cheaply made and will break easily if you're not careful with them. Now going on to the next most important thing that you're gonna need are reeds. And for reeds, I'm going to recommend the Daddario Reserve reeds. So the Daddario Reserves are actually the brand that I play on. I in particular play on the Reserve Evolutions. I recommend just the standard reserves. They're just Daddario Reserve with a little blue label on it. And I definitely recommend size two or maybe two and a half. Um, two and a half might be a little bit strong for a beginner. Size two should be pretty good. 
if you get an instrument that comes with reeds, those reeds are probably not the best. Um, and another really standard beginner instrument reed is the Rico Orange Box, size two or two and a half. And those can work well and they're very affordable. So those are okay to start on, but the Daddario Reserve twos or two and a halves will give you much better quality and more consistency from reed to reed in the box. And those would be a great place to get started or upgrade to shortly after if you get started on like the Rico Orange Box or even you wanna start messing around with any reeds that may have come with your clarinet. When you're starting out, it's a little bit easier to start on a two or a little bit softer strength. For most people and most mouthpieces, around a three to a four is the ultimate end goal. So maybe after six months or a year or so of playing, you might wanna start gradually moving up from two to two and a half, and then a few months on that to threes, and a few months on that to three and a half, and maybe even eventually fours after two to four years of playing, perhaps. Sort of go with what feels good, and if you ever find that your reads just aren't working and they all sort of sound bad or they're dying really quickly, then maybe going a little bit harder can be helpful at that point. But starting at two or two and a half is good. Now that brings me to something I just mentioned, which is the mouthpiece, which is actually another really important part of the instrument. Now, most instruments that you get will come with a mouthpiece some instruments that you get will come with a decent mouthpiece. So a lot of mouthpieces, if they have no marking on them, you can't tell what kind they are, they're probably not that great. And the mouthpiece, along with the reed, are the two probably most important things for making your life playing easy and making things work well. So for mouthpieces, if it has no markings on it and you can't tell what kind of mouthpiece it is, I might recommend upgrading your mouthpiece if you're able to afford that. There are actually some very cheap student beginner level mouthpieces that are really great. So the ones that I would recommend the most is the Clark Fobes debut mouthpiece. That one's about $30 on Amazon. Another good one would be the Premier by Height, or also you can get a Yamaha 4C mouthpiece. Those are all in the about $30 range on Amazon, so they're very affordable. They're pretty good quality for a student level mouthpiece. If you want, you could potentially go for a more professional model, but those will be around $100 to $150 even. So I think for starting out, sticking in this $30 range is a good place to start. One little caveat with this though is these mouthpieces will usually not come with a ligature when you buy them on Amazon. So you may also need a ligature if your clarinet doesn't come with a mouthpiece and a ligature. Most clarinets, like I said, will come with a mouthpiece and with a ligature, but if yours doesn't and you end up buying one of these sort of third party mouthpieces, then you'll also need to buy a ligature. Those also you can get on Amazon for quite affordable, even down to, to five bucks depending on the model. And the ligature, you don't need to worry about anything too fancy to get started. Honestly, you could even use a rubber band or as a hair tie as a ligature if you're really desperate or while you're waiting for the one that you purchased to come in. And if you have no idea what I mean by a ligature, we'll get to that in a minute, but just real quick, First of all, if you just search clarinet ligature, you'll see what it is, but it's this metal piece. Sometimes it's leather, sometimes it's even plastic, but it's the piece that holds the reed onto the mouthpiece. Now, a couple other important pieces of equipment that are kind of optional, may or may not have came with your clarinet, are a swab. This one's pretty important. And then also cork grease. Cork grease is maybe not the most important, but it'll make your life a lot easier. So a swab is just a piece of fabric basically with a string attached to it. You wanna make sure the weighted end is covered. That's probably the most important part of purchasing a swab. Hopefully your clarinet may have come with one. It may have come with a not very great one that has a metal end, so you might wanna upgrade that as well. I have a whole video where I talk about swabs and, and the best swabbing technique and, and all of that stuff if you wanna get into that. And then the last thing is cork grease, which often comes in like a little chapstick tube. And it's just 
grease to put on your corks so that the clarinet goes more easily together. This can be really helpful if you have a brand new instrument. Sometimes the corks can be quite tight and we'll talk about how to use it properly in a moment. But that covers everything that you'll need for equipment to get started. Maybe another thing is a case, but your clarinet most certainly came in a case when you got it, so you should be good to go there. I also have links to all of this equipment stuff down in the description, so if you're looking to purchase any of these, I'll put links to where you can get them just really quickly through Amazon, just to make it easy. Also your local music store, like a music and arts, or really any music store should have most of these things to get you started if they sell band instruments. All right, now let's get into actually assembling the clarinet. Now that we have all our equipment, we are ready to put it together. So once you open up your clarinet case and you have your new fancy clarinet, you will see these things in there. So the first is the mouthpiece and the ligature. Those are probably together, um, but they come apart really easily. They might be in separate parts of your case, depending on the clarinet, but you'll have the mouthpiece, you'll have the ligature, and those go together, and those go at the top of the clarinet. And then the next piece is the barrel, which is just the short little cylinder here that goes next to the mouthpiece and, and goes into the mouthpiece. Then you have the upper joint. The upper joint and the lower joint are a little bit tricky to distinguish from each other sometimes because they look quite similar. The upper joint you can think of has these little trill keys, these little side keys on it, whereas the lower joint has these more levery keys and has this, these keys and these big pads at the bottom. So that's the lower joint, that's the upper joint, and those go together just like that. And then the final piece that goes at the bottom, of course, is the bell. It looks like a bell. It's called a bell. It's really easy to remember. Now, for actually assembling the instrument, this is where your cork grease might come in handy because you can see that each of the joints has some cork around it. And what we do is we grease that up to make it a little bit softer so that the joints can go more easily together. Now a really common mistake that beginners make is putting on way too much cork grease. So what you want to do is take your cork grease, take the lid off, um, push it up a little bit, and then just a tiny bit around, just as if you're putting chapstick on your lips, and then make sure to actually rub it in with your fingers. That's a really important part. It helps to rub off the excess, helps to rub it into the corks a little bit, and then that will make it easier to put together and also make it so that you don't have a mess of cork grease everywhere. Too much cork grease can actually damage the corks over time, so it is really helpful to wipe off that excess. Now for actually putting the instrument together, I start with the mouthpiece and assemble it from the top down. Some people start at the bell and assemble from the bottom up. Either way works perfectly fine. Make sure that you have plenty of space and you're not trying to awkwardly balance things on your lap in the stand like I am because you don't want to drop any of these pieces as you're doing it. So starting with the mouthpiece that goes into the barrel, it's really obvious one end it doesn't really work, the other end actually goes together and feels like it fits right. And again, make sure that you're not squeezing your ligature, don't do anything crazy. This is really easy to put this part together. Now, once we get to the upper joint and the lower joint, it's a little bit more complicated because there's a lot of keys. We want to make sure that we aren't squeezing the keys really hard or squishing any of those. So what I typically recommend is sort of hold it like we'll end up holding it, which I'll talk about later in this video, but sort of put your fingers on the keys that you would normally put your fingers on so that you aren't bumping any side keys. And if you have plenty of cork grease on, it should just pretty easily slide on. One little tip too, you can do a little sort of twisting as it goes on to make it a little bit easier. And if you ever get your joints stuck together where you're having a hard time getting it off, again, that twisting motion can help to pull it off. And also a little bit of a rocking action will also help to sort of loosen it up and get it off. So it should go together easily though if you have cork grease on it and it should come apart really easily if you have cork grease on it. Now the most important part of assembling the clarinet is this little thing called the bridge key. So there's a bridge key on the upper joint and there's also a bridge key on the lower joint. 
You want to make sure that these bridge keys don't smash into each other. This is probably the most common mechanical or repair issue that beginners have is that they put it together and they bend their bridge key and then that causes serious issues. So the way to avoid that is when you're putting it together on the upper joint, you're going to want to press down this ring. If you see when you press that down, it lifts up the bridge key. So again, using my rule of sort of holding the clarinet like you will when you're playing it so that you have this key down, then that lifts that up, you'll be in good shape. Now on the lower joint, you actually don't want to do that because when you press these keys down, it also lifts up the lower joint bridge key. So what you actually want to do instead is not press the keys on the lower joint. This is why I particularly like assembling this way is that there's plenty of room down here to hold where you're not going to be squeezing any keys and you're just pressing or touching the wood or the black plastic of the clarinet. So left hand holds the bridge key up with this key down, right hand holding where there's no keys and then you can just sort of watch that. Again, plenty of cork grease so it easily slides together and you can line the bridge keys up. My bridge keys, you can see there, there's nothing fancy about them. They just line up directly. Some bridge keys have a little wing on them that makes it a little bit more confusing. The best thing to think about when lining them up is actually looking for these posts they're called. So this uh, key goes into this post, this key goes into this post, and if those two posts are more or less lined up, then you're in good shape for the alignment of the instrument. And then the final step, probably the easiest step maybe besides the mouthpiece, is just the barrel goes on at the bottom. Again, easy, plenty of cork grease. Maybe this one is where I might hold the right hand keys just to give me that support. And then you just push the barrel on, no problem. And you now have an assembled clarinet. Now we're still missing probably the most important part of the clarinet, which is the reed. So when you get a box of reeds, they'll probably come in some kind of plastic container individually, like this. This is the Daddario reed container. The Van Doren one works a little bit differently. If you go with Van Doren reeds, which are another really popular brand, the orange box Ricos are very similar to this. Reeds come in all kinds of different packaging, but you'll probably have reeds in some kind of package. It is actually totally fine to store your reeds in these individual packages. Um, I have a video on breaking in reeds and rotating reeds if you want to check that out for more information on what to do with reeds. It might also be a good idea to just grab a simple reed case, which I'll have a link to in the description, that gives you just another place to store these. And I like that to keep track of rotating reeds and keep track of broken in reeds. But for now, this plastic container totally works. So what you're going to do is take your reed out of it. Be careful if you do keep this that you're, you're really careful about putting the reeds away, making sure that you don't chip the tip of it. The tip of the reed is very, very thin and very fragile. So if you're ever pushing on it or bumping it into things, whether it's on your clarinet or just out, sometimes I bump reeds on my teeth and that is sad because it breaks my reeds and sometimes hurts my teeth. Um, but be very careful with the tip of the reed because once that gets broken, the reed won't work super well. But what we're gonna do is actually wet the reed in our mouth. And the way that I do this is really simply, I just put it in. And usually that's actually the first thing I do. So I'll, I'll get my clarinet out, take the reed into my mouth and, and start getting it wet while I'm putting together the instrument. And that's usually a good amount of time. If you wanna be really scientific, maybe one minute of soaking it in your mouth is good. And we do actually wanna get the whole reed wet. So I'll usually put the, the tip end, the thin end in my mouth first and do that for a bit, get it nice and wet. And then I'll also put the other end, which is called the butt end of the reed into my mouth, get that really wet so that both ends of the reed, both ends of the reed are nice and wet. Now, once the reed is wet on both ends, you can put it actually onto the clarinet. So what I recommend is actually taking the ligature off of your mouthpiece. Then you put the flat side of the reed on the flat side of the mouthpiece. You can see that the shape of the reed and the shape of the mouthpiece kind of line up and you more or less want those to be in alignment. 
One quick little sort of advanced trick is if your reed feels really hard and, and like it's too hard to play, you can actually move it down a tiny, tiny bit. If it feels really soft and like it's just sort of squawky and, and almost kazoo-like, then you can move it up a tiny bit and that'll make it feel a little bit more resistant. But for the most part, you want it basically in alignment with the mouthpiece like so. Now the really careful part or the really important part here is when you go to put your ligature on that you don't chip your reed because it's really easy to just bump into the reed with the ligature and then your reed's broken. So just be very careful slipping the ligature over the reed and then you can tighten it on. A couple tips about ligature placement and ligature tightness. First, you want the ligature to be not too far below this little cut in the reed. Um, some reeds will actually have more of a clear line at this cut. This particular cut of reed doesn't, um, but you want it below where the bark of the reed stops. And then you also want to make sure that it's not too tight. It's just just tight enough that the reed isn't gonna be wiggling around really easily, but it doesn't need to be cranked down at all. And the very last tip for ligatures is when you're looking at the reed, you want the screws to tighten on the right side or tighten with your right hand. So you can see, looking at the reed, the screws are over here on the right. This ligature type is technically an inverted ligature because the screws are on the opposite side of the reed. Some ligatures have the screws on the same side of the reed. Those are actually the more standard kind, and then this one's inverted. The best way to know is just always tighten the screws with your right hand when you're looking at the reed. All right, now that the instrument is assembled, we are just about ready to start playing it. But first, I wanna talk about how to actually make a sound. So there's actually three really, really important parts of making a sound, and I like to sort of organize it into a triangle because I, it sort of helps to remember and also shows the importance and the hierarchy of this sort of foundational thing, but the really, truly most important thing, which is the air. And this is what I call the how to play clarinet triangle or the making a great sound triangle is another good way to think about it. But let's talk first about the air and what the air should be doing on the clarinet. So hopefully you know that the clarinet is a wind instrument and that means that we actually use the wind or our air to make the sound. And the way that that works is we actually blow into the mouthpiece and the reed vibrates against the mouthpiece and that's what causes the sound of the clarinet. So the air is actually the number one most important part of the clarinet sound because the air vibrating and resonating through the instrument is the sound. So the air is the most important because the air is the sound. So let's talk about how to actually get good air and use your air correctly to make a great sound on the clarinet. So you probably haven't thought about this too much, but there's actually a whole lot of different ways to blow your air. If you think about maybe birthdays that you've been to, especially pre-COVID birthdays where we would blow out candles, um, people would maybe have all kinds of different blowing techniques to, to blow out their birthday candles. Maybe a or or and all of those different kinds of blowing techniques will actually make different sounds on the clarinet. So if you have that sort of puff cheeks, really explosive wide air, that creates not so great of a sound. We don't really like that. If you instead have a really focused airstream, then you'll start to get a good sound. And the way to do that, the way that I like to think about doing that is actually by using a straw. So if you have a little coffee stir straw, um, that would be perfect for this. It's just a little single tube straw. The straws that are wider will sort of encourage that bigger, wider airstream. So this really narrow straw is perfect. And if you blow through that straw, listen to the sound that you get. So I'm blowing a pretty strong stream and, and really supporting the air and, and moving lots of air through this little straw. And you can hear that little bit of whistle to it. And that's what we want our air to feel like and sound like when we're actually blowing into the clarinet is that little 
that sort of whistle. And actually, if you can practice, if you can make the sound with the straw the same as the sound without the straw as you're blowing, then you'll be in really good shape. Now that might be a little tricky. You might probably naturally get something more like when you're blowing without the straw. And that's because there's actually some stuff inside our mouth that we have to do to direct the air with our tongue. And the tongue actually is one of the very important parts of the triangle. I put it down here in the bottom right. And this tongue position is really important and obviously connected to the air because the way our tongue is shaped influences the direction and sort of the shape of the air. So in order to match that straw sound and get that good whistly air, I like to think of the tongue sort of doing three things. So the back of the tongue is in this very high E vowel. So if you try saying E, you can hear that. And if you sort of say he and blow air, maybe sort of like a hissing cat, you'll get the feel for that. But that's not exactly the right sound because that doesn't totally match the straw. That's not exactly the right one. So what we have to do next is think about the middle of the tongue, and the middle of the tongue sort of comes forward, where in the E, the tongue, the tip of the tongue and the middle of the tongue sort of going straight down and you have this shape. For the next step, we have E in the back, and then the middle of the tongue does a little bit of an U to sort of move forward. So we have he, U, he, U, <laughs> and that's pretty close to the straw sound. Then the final step is just maybe angling the tip of the tongue up a tiny bit, getting it really close to the entrance of our mouth, and then also squeezing in the corners of our mouth and making a nice circle. So you go from he, 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 to he, he, with the corners in. And that's where we start to sound like the straw. Now, as with everything in the clarinet playing, uh, I'm sort of describing how to do it and how it feels to me. And it may get a little complicated to think like, okay, he, ew, ew, and you may not get it exactly right. And that's okay. I'm just telling you ways that I think of it, but what really matters is that you match the straw. So whatever you have to think about to match that straw sound, that's what you wanna go for, is that good whistly, A couple other really important things about the air is you want to make sure that it's strong enough so that it can be steady. If your air is unsteady, where you sort of have where it doesn't sound like a continuous steady then that'll cause problems when we get to playing the instrument and you won't have a steady clear sound like we want to get on the instrument. Now, I already started talking about this a little bit, but there is one other final step to the making a great sound or how to play clarinet triangle, and that's down in this corner, which is the embouchure. Embouchure is a really fancy French word that means how you put your mouth onto the instrument. Now, there's several steps to the embouchure, but I want to go back to the straw and actually use our straw to come up with a good embouchure. So if you take your straw and actually plug the end of it, then put it in your mouth and sort of put your top teeth on the straw, because we'll do that on the clarinet, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but plug the straw, put your top teeth on, and then suck through it like you're trying to drink your finger through the straw. Now, as you do that, you'll probably see that naturally your corners really squeeze in, your top lip comes down, and maybe even your chin sort of starts to point down and get this sort of flat chin, which is an important part of the embouchure. I'll do it from the side so you can see what my face does as I do this exercise. So hopefully you can see that chin flattening out, the corners coming in, the top lip coming down, and hopefully you get that as well naturally when you try this exercise with the straw. If you don't have a straw, you can also just do this with your finger where you stick your finger in your mouth and then pretend your finger is the straw. 
and that gives you the sort of same effect. Now one thing that might go wrong with this is as you start sucking, you actually bite down and squeeze down, maybe something like this. That's kind of normal. Some people will drink their milkshakes like that or, or when they're using a straw naturally you sort of bite down. That's not good for the clarinet. It's actually not good for drinking your milkshakes either because it might cause the straw to squeeze shut. So if you ever squeeze super tight when you're, when you're trying to drink like a really frozen milkshake and the straw just shuts and you don't get any milkshake, then maybe this technique will actually help with your milkshake drinking too, which I'm a big fan of. <laughs> but in any case, you wanna make sure that you aren't squeezing down, you aren't biting this way as you do this. And instead actually think about sort of pushing the straw up into your top teeth so that there's not too much jaw pressure on it. And then think about this chin going down, opening your jaw so that the straw's not collapsing and so that eventually the reed isn't being squeezed shut either. All right, now let's talk about actually putting this embouchure onto the clarinet and starting to make a sound. So what I actually wanna do is disassemble our clarinet a little bit for this. I want you to take your barrel and your mouthpiece off of the upper joint and you can put the upper joint aside for a second. If you have a clarinet stand, which might be a good bonus equipment, then you can put it on your stand and that's great. If not, which is totally fine, lay your clarinet down this way so that the keys are facing up and lay it either on a table where it's gonna be sturdy and secure or even on the floor where nobody's going to be stepping on it or anything like that, just so there's no chance of it falling off. You definitely don't wanna put your clarinet on the music stand like this because it'll fall off. So clarinet aside for now, just the mouthpiece and barrel. You may, if you're doing this in real time and watching through the video, you may wanna re-wet your reed because it's probably dried out now and a dry reed isn't going to vibrate well. But let's talk about this embouchure stuff. So like I mentioned with the straw, you want to put your top teeth on the mouthpiece and you want to do it, you can actually see I have sort of an indentation in my mouthpiece patch and you wanna do it about that far down. So maybe it's a quarter inch, maybe a centimeter or so down from the tip of the mouthpiece. And we'll talk about a little exercise to do to find the right spot. So the way to do it to find the right spot is first make that good straw sucking embouchure and then put your mouthpiece in your mouth and then as you blow into it, see what kind of sound you get. You may have something kind of honky like that and that's perfectly okay. We'll talk about how to fix that. That probably is coming from too much mouthpiece in your mouth where there's a little bit too much reed vibrating. If you have a honky or even a squawky sound like then that's too much mouthpiece. If you have a really thin sound or sometimes I call that a little bit of a constipated sound then there's too little mouthpiece and too little reed in your mouth. So what you can do is a little exercise where you try very little and then add more and more and more to find the best sound. That is definitely too much. But you notice the best sound was right about before that. So you can experiment and find that good sound. Now something that might be really good to do before this is actually just start by making a sound. So what you do is put your top teeth on and then you can actually use the mouthpiece sort of as your straw as you breathe in and think and then get that good e, u, air, th, that straw sound to the air. So you breathe in through your mouthpiece straw and then blow out with that whistly straw sounding air through your mouthpiece and barrel. And as you go from breathing in, that sets your embouchure up really well in this shape. Then as you blow out, keep it. Now when we're actually playing, it's not super efficient to breathe in through the straw. 
because you can't get very much air through this, especially even more so when the clarinet is attached, you can't actually get that much air. This is a great exercise for setting up your embouchure, but eventually when you're actually playing, you'll want to get used to keeping your embouchure as set as possible, but breathing through the corners of your mouth. And then setting up in that good straw embouchure. So now that you know how the air, the embouchure, and the tongue position should work, you're able to make a great sound. Again, it'll probably take a bit of practice, and the things that I would recommend practicing are doing with your straw, getting the sound, figuring out how to get that whistly air sound, and then also with the straw, getting your embouchure. You also might want to even look in a mirror or use your selfie camera to check it out and see if you can get approximately this shape where the chin is nice and flat, the top lip is coming down, your top teeth will eventually be on the mouthpiece, and your corners are coming in, so you have this circle. So practice getting that shape to your embouchure. And then you can practice actually making sound on the mouthpiece and barrel. And feel free to experiment. Try maybe different embouchure shapes a little bit and small adjustments to it to see what makes it sound the best, more or less. You can also experiment with the angle of the reed in your mouth as well to see the different kinds of sounds that you can get. The goal on the mouthpiece and barrel is to have a sound like this. You can hear how it's a very steady sound right from the beginning all the way to the end. And theoretically with a tuner, it should be approximately a concert F sharp or the clarinet's G sharp. If you have a tuner and you know how to use it, that can be another good way to aim for this. But the most important thing is just the steadiness to it. Now there's just a couple more really important fundamental things that I want to share with you before we actually put the clarinet together and start playing some music. So with the tongue, the tongue actually has two functions. There's the tongue position that we talked about, that he, you, and then there's also tongue motion that touches the reed to create separate notes. So oftentimes beginner band teachers or in beginning band, you will learn to say a vowel like two, 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 or ta, 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 or maybe even t, t, t. And that's great, but that teaches us something a little bit weird. The tongue motion in two, two, two is exactly right. Our tongue should be sort of doing that t that T kind of sound where the tip of the tongue ends up touching the tip of the reed to stop the vibrations of the reed, resulting in no sound, and then comes off of the tip of the reed, letting the reed vibrate, starting the sound again. The problem with saying two, two, two is what we do with our air. If you try saying that right now, you'll notice that your air sort of goes with it and does and that's probably the number one mistake that beginners make when learning how to tongue is that they move their air too much and that the air is fluctuating. So it's instead of just a continuous steady stream of air. So what I like to do instead is to think of saying ooh, and you can sort of sing it or hum it ooh, and then just moving your tongue as if you're saying a T syllable or saying the T letter. But don't think about actually saying two, two, two. Just think about moving the tip of your tongue and maybe even think about moving the tip of the tongue between your lips. So you get This you can hear that it's very steady. It's staying continuous the whole time. And then the tongue is just sort of going in between and interrupting that. It doesn't sound like a clear two, 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 two because I'm not using the air along with it. But this will actually sound a lot better on the clarinet once we put it together. One other thing that I wanna mention about the tongue before we actually get into trying it is that we have that good shape that we talked about, the E and then the U and then the tip of the tongue's nice and close to the reed. You wanna make sure that it's just the tip of the tongue moving and that you aren't losing this great shape to the air. If you're practicing your straw air, and then you try tugging, it should stay nice and whistly the whole time. If you get something like this, 
where it loses the whistle right after you touch your tongue between your lips, then that means that your tongue is moving too far away from the reed and too much of your tongue is moving, so it's losing that good position and good focus. Remember that position of the tongue is the first most important for the sound. The motion of the tongue that I'm talking about is just to create articulation, create separations in the notes. If you want a more advanced look at all of this tongue motion stuff, then check out this video that I made that goes really in depth with some drawings of sort of where the tongue should be and how the tongue works in all kinds of different articulations. All right, now we are ready to try putting that on the clarinet or at least the mouthpiece and barrel of the clarinet. So first I want you to think about that good, just steady sound that we have. So top teeth on the mouthpiece, that good straw sucking in embouchure, that good straw sound going out air, and then we get that steady sound. And that steady sound is sort of our ooh, and now we can try tying ooh, thoo, 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 or with the air, or with the mouthpiece and barrel. And that is actually pretty much everything that you're ever gonna need to play any sound on the clarinet. If you can play with a great steady sustained sound on this and you can tongue with that very clear tonguing like that, then you should be good to go. A couple issues you might hear with your tonguing though are maybe something like this. That means you're moving your tongue around too much or maybe something like this. That means you're doing too much of the two, two, where you're really pushing the air at the start and then backing off the air in between rather than ooh, 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 where that air is always going. Now the final fundamental thing of making a sound is actually how to start sounds. So I call this the sound preparation process. And what the sound preparation process is, is a simple sort of method, a simple process to getting your sound started sounding great. You may notice as you've been practicing on just this that sometimes you don't always start super clear. You might have a little or a where it sort of is an accent at the beginning. The sound preparation process will fix this. So this is the sound preparation process and this goes for just starting your very first note. So what you're gonna do is breathe in like we talked about with your embouchure mostly set, breathe in through the corners, and then actually set your embouchure. Then you place your tongue on the reed, so the tip of the tongue goes onto the tip of the reed. And then you start blowing. Now when you start blowing here, you're actually not going to get sound because your tongue is on the reed so that there's no reed vibrations happening, no sound happening. Then you take your tongue off the reed and that's when the sound happens. So I'll do a little sort of x-ray of my tongue here to show you what my tongue's doing and you can also see my embouchure get set and I'll also leak so that you can hear the air and you'll see I breathe in, set the embouchure, tongue on the reed, start blowing, tongue comes off the reed and that's when the sound starts. The thing that's nice about using this sound preparation process and starting with our tongue on the reed is that it allows us to get the air moving and the air flowing at the right speed, get that whistle air going before we're actually making a sound so that right when the tongue comes off the reed, the air is in position to start the note. This is what helps prevent that where you sort of have to warm up the air and, and get the air going before the sound starts because you have that moment of your tongue on the reed to get the air going before you actually start playing the note. So that allows you to build up the air pressure and get the air moving so that the sound comes out right away like this. Now this sound preparation process is kind of a lot of steps, but it happens really quickly. In real time, it goes more like this. So there's 
almost no time between setting the embouchure and putting the tongue on the reed, and almost no time between actually blowing and taking the tongue off the reed too. It sort of all happens in one nice, easy circle of just so it has a good flow to it and is really easy. But thinking about starting with your tongue on the reed will be really helpful for sounding really good. All right, now that you can get a great sound on this, you start with a great sound, you can touch your tongue to the reed and continue that great sound while interrupting it with the tongue, I think we are ready to put the clarinet together and start playing some music. So the first thing that I want you to do now that you have the clarinet back together is I want you to just start by making one sound on the clarinet. Don't worry at all what your fingers are doing yet. Make sure that you aren't covering any holes or bumping any keys. Maybe you could hold the barrel like we were holding the barrel before and even rest the bell of the clarinet on your knees or something like that. And what we're gonna do is just play a note the exact same way using the sound preparation process, holding a note, you can even try tonguing it a bit if you'd like. And hopefully, if you're sounding great on just the mouthpiece and barrel, then you're probably sounding like a pretty good clarinet right now. And honestly, you might sound quite similar to how I sound on the video because you have that good embouchure and that good air and all of the fundamental things in place. So congratulations on making a great sound on the clarinet. Now that you have the whole clarinet in your hands, you have to actually figure out how to hold the clarinet with your hands. So my favorite way to describe this is just relaxing your hand, shake it out by your side. If you aren't holding your clarinet, you could do it with both hands. And then just bring it up and see how natural and relaxed your hand position is. You have sort of this natural curve to your fingers. And then you wanna to try to put that sort of in front of the clarinet holes. The way the clarinet works for our fingers is that our first finger on our left hand covers the very top hole. Left hand goes on the upper joint, right hand goes on the bottom joint. So you put your first finger on this first hole. You don't put a finger on this because that's a pad. So you put your finger on the next hole and then your ring finger on the next hole. And then your pinky is free to play with some of these keys, which we won't get into in this video. Um, and then really important on clarinet, and this is actually pretty unique to clarinet, is there's actually a hole on the back for our thumb. So you wanna make sure that your left thumb is there. And again, if you see I take this, if I take the clarinet away, my hand is in that good, natural, relaxed position. So have that relaxed position, get it in front of the holes that it needs to cover like so, and you'll be in good shape. Same thing happens for the right hand. We don't cover this pad because that's a pad. It's a hole, not a hole that needs to be covered. We start with the first hole, then our middle finger on the next hole, then our ring finger on the next hole. And again, our pinky is free to worry about these pinky keys. Now the right hand is a little unique because there's actually a thumb rest on the back. Your thumb rest probably looks more like this and doesn't have anything fancy on it, but I definitely recommend getting some kind of something to, to go on there to make it a little bit more comfortable to hold. There are real thumb rests you can buy. Um, this is actually just a piece of latex tubing. Another thing that works really well are pencil grips, the little grippies that you put on like a mechanical pencil or a wood pencil. Um, just put that on, clip off the extra. You can even leave the extra on, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, but having something on there is good. And that's where your right thumb is gonna go under there. Now again, notice that my thumb is in a position that allows my hand to be relaxed. My hand is here, it has that relaxed shape. That's where my thumb ends up. Hopefully you can see that sort of thumb angle. Notice that it's quite close to the tip of my thumb. It's not all the way at the tip, it's not at this knuckle or even past this knuckle. It's sort of where the nail meets the skin. You'll also notice when I hold it this way that my thumb isn't perpendicular to the clarinet. It's also not perpendicular this way to the clarinet or even perpendicular in any way to the thumb rest. It's actually more of a 45 degree angle to the thumb rest. Everybody's hand shapes are different and if you're a younger beginner, your hand might be smaller so it might cause things to be different. What matters is that your hand is relaxed, 
and that you have this natural curve to things and that you're covering the holes. That's again another really common mistake that beginners make is just not covering the holes all the way and it takes a little practice to find those holes and get them covered. Think about aiming for this sort of part of your pad of your clarinet or of your finger to cover the clarinet holes. This pad on your finger is nice and big, has a lot of surface area to really cover those holes. And if you're nice and relaxed with your fingers, then that skin will naturally sort of fill in the holes and you'll get comfortable feeling that. I might recommend actually as an exercise, even before you worry about playing, just hold the clarinet, get comfortable with where your hands are on the clarinet and get comfortable feeling each of these holes and, and knowing what it feels like to have your fingers really covering the holes and have your hand in this good, relaxed, natural position for both of them. Another thing that's really good to know about the fingers is the fingers are actually what's gonna make the different notes and different sounds. So when we're playing with no fingers, that was an open G, no fingers down, and the sound coming out was a clarinet sounding G. And if we put more fingers down, then we actually get lower notes. So I'm gonna start with the thumb and then do each finger on the left hand and each finger on the right hand, making sure to cover those holes and you'll hear all of the different notes as it goes down. And you can hear as we add more fingers down, it gets lower, less holes covered, less fingers down, are higher notes. All right, you can make a great sound, you know how to start a great sound, you know how to hold the clarinet and how to put your fingers on, so that means we are ready to start playing some music. All right, so now we have a little melody here. I'm not gonna go super in depth with reading music. Uh, perhaps you know a little bit about reading music, but I'm just gonna give a couple pointers and sort of talk through this, and more importantly, talk about how to put it onto the clarinet. But for music, just like I had for the clarinet, I have a little triangle of the three important things. The first one is the rhythm, so that's when you play the notes. The next one are the actual notes, so that's the pitch of the notes that you play. And then the last one is the style, which sort of creates the character of the music, the flow of the music, and how the music sort of sounds. It's the difference between rock and roll and classical, maybe Mozart. So the rhythm is the first most important. It's extremely important. I have a whole playlist of videos talking about how to count rhythms and how to make sure your rhythms are good. So let's start there. So the first thing to look at for rhythms is actually your time signature. So this is 4-4, four, four, meaning that there's four quarter notes per measure. These are quarter notes, and then there's some other notes that we'll talk about in a moment. So if this is a quarter note and we're in 4-4, four, four, then that means that we're trying to find the four quarter notes and trying to figure out how the actual written rhythms match with this four quarter note time signature. So that means within this measure, so from the beginning to the bar line, and then between this bar line and this bar line, in every single one of those measures, there's going to be four quarter notes, and we get to be sort of detectives to find them. So the first quarter note is really easy. That just happens on one, the first quarter note. And then the second quarter note is also really easy. That's right there. And then the third quarter note actually starts here but this is actually a half note. A half note takes up two quarter notes worth of time, so it's gonna take up our third and fourth quarter note. So I draw a little dash going through the four to show that we're sustaining through four. So this basically becomes one, two, three, four. And that's what this rhythm is. Another really important thing about rhythms is that this is the counting, this is where you play, this is where the four quarter notes from the time signature are, but it's really important that those become steady. So one, two, three, four. Those numbers have to be a steady beat so that this sounds like one, two, three, one, two, three, four. If you don't have this steady, then this could become any rhythm. It could be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 
those are not the same as this rhythm because they're not with a steady beat. So the second measure is the same, and this is actually a good little trick for reading music. Oftentimes there will be lots of patterns and lots of repetitions, so if you notice that this is the same as this, then all you have to do is learn this, and you have them both learned. So this one's also one, two, three, four. Now here we have eighth notes, which are a different rhythm. Eighth notes are half of a quarter note, so there's two eighth notes per beat. But we can still find that four, four beats, those four quarter notes, because one starts here, but instead of just being one, it's divided, so we call that one and, and then we're to two, and two is also divided into two notes, so that becomes two and, three, also divided into two notes, and then four is divided into two notes. So this leaves us with one and, two and, three and, four and, but again we have to put it with the steady beat, and the steady beat still lines up with each number, so we have our steady beat, and then make that line up with the numbers, one and, two and, three and, four and. So this all together becomes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and. And then you might know how this song actually finishes with another repetition. One, two, three. And that's actually all of Hot Cross Buns that we just figured out the rhythm for. All right, now that we have the rhythm down, we're ready to start talking about the notes. That's the next step on the triangle. So for the notes, the way that it works is we look at the treble clef to know what these notes actually mean. The clarinet is a treble clef instrument. Even the bass clarinet is mostly a treble clef instrument. Every now and then it reads in bass clef, but mostly treble clef. And what that means is that this line that the treble clef is sort of circling. If you look at the circle, it kind of looks like a G, and this line that it circles is the G line. Sometimes the treble clef is known as the G clef because this line that it circles, every note that happens on this line is a G. Now, in this, hot cross buttons, we don't actually have uh, any Gs that we play, um, but we can use that information to figure out some of the other notes. And also, if you are familiar with treble clef, you may know that these lines actually have an acronym of every good boy deserves fudge, or every good boy does fine, and that's the names of those notes that land on that line. The spaces are also an acronym. They spell out face, F-A-C-E. And if you put that together, you actually end up just counting through the alphabet. E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F. You may notice that from G, instead of going on to H like we normally go through in the alphabet, we actually skip back from G back to A because the musical alphabet actually only goes to G, so it loops back around to A. But as we go up, the pitch of the notes go up, and we go forwards through the alphabet. So with that information, we can start to figure out the actual note names for these notes. So this first one is on the bottom line, which is the E line for every and every good boy does fine. So that means that this first note is an E. Now the next note actually isn't in that acronym because it's below the staff, but we can use that other piece of knowledge that we have to figure it out. So as we go up from line to space, line, space, line, space, we go forwards through the alphabet. So if we're going down from line, space, line, space, then we go backwards through the alphabet. So this note is actually one space lower than E, so it's one letter backwards in the alphabet, down from E, which is D. Same thing with this next note, it has that little line through it, that's called a ledger line, and that means that it's one backwards from D. So we go backwards one through the alphabet to C. Again, the second measure is identical to the first measure in rhythm and in notes, so that's just another E, D, C. And then this last measure, even though it's eighth notes, even though it's a different rhythm, it's still the same because it has that one ledger line through it, so we have again C, 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 and then it goes up one this time from the line to this space, so it goes forwards through the alphabet, and that becomes D, 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 
D. And then there's one other part of the triangle to figure out, and that's the style. Style includes a whole bunch of things like the dynamics, articulations, tempo, character, all kinds of different things. But in this case, we're going to get into one specific part. All those other parts are a little bit more advanced, a little more complicated. You'll learn more in depth later. But the style here that's really important is these little swoopies that are called slurs. What a slur means is that there's going to be no tonguing happening between these notes. So these notes are really, really connected and the only thing that changes between them is the fingering. Whereas these notes don't have a slur, so these ones are actually going to be tongued or articulated using that sort of ooh, two, 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 two that we talked about and that we practiced tonguing on the mouthpiece and barrel. So when you have this slur, it's no tonguing, one stream of air, and then you tongue at the start of this slur, no tonguing, one stream of air, and then you tongue at each of these notes, still one stream of air, but you're just tonguing to separate them. So this becomes, start with the sound preparation process with the tongue on the reed, it becomes two, do, 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 and then if you wanna finish it and make it sound like hot cross buns, which is what this is, then you just do one measure of this. And that's the whole song. And it's all just one continuous stream of air. No matter if you're not tonguing or if you are tonguing, all still one stream of air. Now in order to actually play this, the last thing you're gonna need is to actually figure out how to play these notes on the instrument. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you the first one, and then I bet you can figure out the rest of them from there. So this very first note, this E, the way that you finger it is with your thumb and your first finger. Another way to figure this out without actually me telling this to you in case you're looking at other music someday and you need to figure out a fingering is to look at a fingering chart. If you don't have a fingering chart, just go to Google and search clarinet fingering chart and you can find a whole bunch of them. The way it works is it'll show the note on the staff, it'll give you the name of it, and then it'll also show the clarinet fingering. So it'll be a little diagram that shows like the thumb and the first finger are covered in this case for the E. Now you know that as we go lower, we put more fingers down, and you know based on this melody that you probably know, or at least the way that I sing it, that we're going down the staff, we're going down in pitch, so we're gonna be going down in fingers as well. So if E is the first finger with the thumb, the D becomes the second finger, so two fingers down with the thumb, and the C is three fingers down with the thumb, because again, that's one lower. And look at that, that's all of the notes in this whole piece because it's only using three notes. So you have all of the notes that you need to play this whole passage. So get your embouchure set up, Think of that sound preparation process, use that good air and embouchure that we've talked about already, use that good tonguing that we've gone over, set your steady beat for the rhythm, and then wiggle your fingers in time, and you'll be playing Hot Cross Buns, maybe your first song on the clarinet. I'm gonna go ahead and stand up and demonstrate it so you can see my fingers and hear how it goes with a steady beat. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And I added the extra measure. I don't have enough room for all of it on my whiteboard and in the video uh, angle, but you know there's another measure of it because that's just how it goes, right? So I'm gonna put up like the full music and some tips real quick and I want you to pause it and actually practice this and see if you can do it. And then once you're able to do it and you are done, then we can go on to the next bit of the video. Yeah, congratulations, you played your first song, you played Hot Cross Buns on the clarinet. At the start of this video, you maybe didn't even have a clarinet, but over the time of watching it and pausing it and working on getting a good sound and figuring out how the fingers work, you've done it, you've played a piece of music. I'm so excited for you. And the best part is you probably sounded pretty good because you went through all that fundamental stuff and really got that good foundation down before you just dive into this melody. So that's awesome for you that you're playing your first song and sounding pretty darn good on it, I bet, 
as well. Now, I want to continue and, and sort of give you the next steps or the things to focus on from here to make you a really great player. These are the things that the professionals think about. Even myself, every single time I practice, these are the things that I'm thinking about and the same kinds of exercises that I'm working on. So I'm going to give you sort of the secret formula, the secret ingredient, the secrets to becoming a really great clarinet player, starting from this sort of beginner level you're at and giving you the tools to become really great with just a little bit of practice. All right, here is the secret formula to becoming a great clarinetist. So if you stop and think about it, there's really only a handful of things that we actually need to be able to do on the clarinet, no matter how crazy the piece that we're playing is. So the first thing is to sound great on the notes that you're playing. The second thing is to be able to move between different notes and play a bunch of different notes. And then the final thing is to just shape the notes and articulate the notes as the music indicates. And really there's nothing else that the music requires of us. Even the very, very, very hardest pieces that have notes all over the place and are really fast and crazy things like that, it's still just sounding good on those notes, moving between those notes with your fingers, and articulating the notes as indicated. So these three things, this is what I call the three-step warm-up, targets each of those. And if you can do them really well on this, it'll be easier to do them on other things. And unfortunately, if you can't play something super simple like this with the very, very best quality and the quality that you want, then you won't be able to play the harder stuff with the quality you want. So these are your fundamentals. These are your vegetables. This is the foundation of your building. This stuff is what's going to make you a good clarinetist if you practice it regularly and practice it in the right way. So if you notice, it's pretty much just the same notes as hot cross buns, just with some different rhythms. And there are two new notes. So we already know C is three fingers, D is two, E is one. F is the next note because we're going up one more um, to the next space, so that's F is just the thumb. And then you actually did sort of already learn G, which is just no fingers, just an open G. And that's all of the notes for each of these. Now the rhythms are really interesting and really significant. In the long tones, it's just whole notes, every single measure. Um, in fact, on the long tones, you don't even have to worry about keeping track of how long these, these whole notes are. Long tones are like the only thing ever where rhythm doesn't really matter. So the goal for this is to just hold each note until it sounds good, memorize how it feels when it sounds its very best, and then move smoothly to the next note. So let me go ahead and demonstrate this super simple long tone exercise. And again, good embouchure, teeth on, whistly air, all that good stuff we already talked about. So just super easy, up and down, but holding each note long so it sounds really good. And you noticed I repeated one note in there. I didn't like the way it sounded, so I'm, I just went back and fixed it. This is just for practicing and this is just for your own benefit, so feel free to stop, adjust, fix things as needed. You'll also notice that I did take a breath. I didn't slur through this whole thing because that's a really long ways to go and you will most certainly need to breathe a few places maybe as you go. When you do breathe, notice I breathed on this E. I stopped on the E, I finished it nicely, I took a breath, I used my sound preparation process to start the, the E going again, and then went on to the D. The reason why I'm breathing in the middle of the notes rather than in between is to practice a good transition between all the notes. Because that's part of the point. Good sound and good transitions between the notes. Now moving on to technique, sorry this is a little sloppy, but it's the same exact notes, but just in a different rhythm. So what we're doing now is actually eighth notes up, 
to G, and then eighth notes back down to the C. And on this one, the rhythm is important on these eighth notes especially, making sure that it's actually steady. So you should know how to count these eighth notes and know that it goes one and two and three and four and one. Really super duper simple. Notice also this is all slurred. The long tones are also all slurred. We don't need to worry about the tongue moving yet because on this one, we're just worried about sound. On technique, we're worried about moving the fingers really precisely in time. So let me play this one and I'll stand up so you can see my precise finger motion as well. So you'll notice my fingers stayed close to the keys, moved really in rhythm, everything was relaxed and easy, and I tried as hard as I could to keep the good sound quality I established in the long tones, but now moving more rhythmically precise and getting the fingers involved a little bit more. And then the final step, or the final part of the three-step warm-up, is articulation. Again, same exact notes, but a little bit different rhythm and different articulation this time. Before we were just slurring for the articulation, now we're actually tonguing because the point of this exercise is to get our tongue motion going well. So I start off with a half note C to make sure that my sound is good to start. We always want that good sound. And then I just tongue to interrupt the sound, touch the tongue to the reed like we've talked about, and then do that on four times for each note going up to the G. So this one sounds like this. And this one you could also go back down if you wanted some more practice and more uh, work on each of these notes and, and the tongue motion. But remember again, it's the same steady air the whole time. And just the tip of the tongue doing all the work. On this one also the rhythm being steady is really important so that you get control over when your tongue is moving. Just like in the technique we want control over when our fingers are moving. Because in music we have to move our tongue and move our fingers at very precise times. So you can see by practicing these you can get a great sound, you can get great finger motion, and you can get great tongue motion and articulation and shape to the notes, and that's all you'll ever need to play any piece of music. Sure, you might want to vary these exercises and do some more notes because eventually you will have to play more than five notes. Um, you might want to work on going faster, you might want to change the lengths of the notes, but that's all a little bit more advanced stuff. For now, if you're practicing even these three exercises exactly how they go, you're going to be in great shape and hopefully all the other stuff that you've gotten from this video will also help you to be in great shape and really confident with getting started on the clarinet. Whew. If you made it to the end, congratulations. You now officially know how to play the clarinet. This stuff, even though there's more notes that usually get taught in the first year, like this will get you sounding great and will get you really confident. And really learning more notes is no problem at all. It's just different finger combinations and visually different on the page. So congratulations, you now know how to play the clarinet. If you've really taken your time to implement and think about these things and actually try them out on your own, you're gonna be in great shape. Now, I want to give you a couple other things, a, a couple other resources to continue developing in your clarinet journey. I have a couple things that I think would be really beneficial for somebody who's at about your level where you're just starting out and, and getting ready to really excel at the clarinet. So first of all, I have a free members area that has a bunch of downloads. Th these usually went along with different videos that I've done on the YouTube channel, and there's some other great things in there. There's scale exercises, a couple other little warm-up things, and things like that. And it's all the, the handouts that I've made before that are really helpful for clarinetists of really all ability level. So if you're interested in that, go to quickstartclarinet.com slash get started. You just put in your name and email. Um, if you're a kid, have your parents put in their name and email so you can get all of the downloads and all that good stuff. And that will give you some more resources to start thinking about and start working on in your clarinet journey. 
And if you want something even a little bit more guided than that, a little bit more specific, then I highly recommend my clarinet method book, The Next Generation Clarinet Method. It's a little bit more intermediate. It might be a little bit tricky and you, you'll just have to work through it slow if you're just coming from this video, but it'll be really great for you in the long run and will give you lots and lots of tools and techniques to become a really great clarinetist. So if you're interested in that, go to quickstartclarinet.com slash nextgenbook. The link to the uh, free members area, that's all completely free. The Next Generation Clarinet Method is a paid program that I have because it's a whole book and, and has lots of videos and instructions and, and all kinds of stuff. So that does cost $27, but you can go to quickstartclarinet.com slash nextgenbook, learn all about it, there's more information there, and you can buy it through there as well. And if you do happen to be a more intermediate player or you feel really confident after watching this video that you're ready for something just a little bit more advanced, then I highly recommend you check out my newest free training, the five must know clarinet tips. That actually takes some of the stuff that we talked about in here. There's a little bit about rhythm. There's a little bit more about um, warmups and the three step warm up process and also some other really, really valuable tips and goes super in depth. That's another like hour long video of training Training that's more for the intermediate, um, maybe even a little bit leaning towards the advanced side of things. So if you feel like you are ready for something more advanced than this video, then check that out at quickstartclarinet.com slash training. That's completely free too. You just have to register and put in your email and you get to watch that training immediately. So thank you so much for checking this out. I hope that this has been a helpful resource and will be helpful as you continue to work on clarinet and learn how to become a great clarinetist. If you enjoyed this, then be sure to subscribe to this channel because I have lots and lots of tips. I already have over almost 200 videos up as of now, I think. So there's lots and lots of tips. Most of the videos are much shorter than this one. This was sort of almost like a whole video course in one YouTube video, but the other ones are a little shorter, a little bit more quick and, and simple to implement. But I wanted to put something together that can really help you get started and have a truly quick start to the clarinet as the uh, channel name implies. So so thank you for watching. If there's anything I can do to help with your clarinet journey, let me know in the comments on this. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in another video.